So, hello everyone. Words About Books is a poorly spoken podcast. My name is Ben, and I am not here with my co-host, Nate. He has been replaced, possibly forever. Ha ha! I am instead here with my wife, Spooky Shy. Boo. <laughs> Shut up, Ben. <laughs> In all honesty, Nate has not actually been replaced forever. He is out on paternity leave. And while he is gone, I have decided to record a couple of special guest episodes. The first of which being with my wife, who is a huge fan of the Five Nights at Freddy's franchise and has decided to make me read one of the books based on that franchise. And as we all know... I love video game books. They're my favorite thing in the world. I don't think they're at all stupid. And Benjamin's a terrible liar. Uh, Before we get started, I just wanted to quickly mention the title of the book and the author for those who would like to follow along at home. We are covering a little bit of the entire franchise, but mostly the text in Five Nights at Freddy's The Silver Eyes by Scott Cawthon and Kira Breed Risley. You're the you're the super fan here. I would hardly call myself a super fan. I would call you a super fan. I'm I'm like a backseat super fan. I let everybody else do the work and I just am along for the ride. Because you're afraid to play the games? I just don't have the attention span for it and I also am afraid to play the games. So, why don't you tell me a little bit about what Five Nights at Freddy's is and why you're so in love with it? Five Nights at Freddy's is Basically, a horror twist on everybody's favorite animatronic mouse company. Uh, is it Disney or is it... No, it's, it's... I'm making fun of... When everybody hears famous mouse, they're like, oh, Mickey? Like, no, Chucky. Oh, no, wait, Chucky, not- Je- Jesus, that went right over my head. <laughs> I'm, I'm so old that I was like, no, it's obviously the showbiz pizza bear. Chucky, it's showbiz pizza bear, Chucky e. Cheese. Does Chucky e. Cheese have animatronics? You've never been to a Chuck E. Cheese? I may not have ever been to a Chuck E. Cheese. Wow. I grew up poor and I've been to Chuck E. Cheese. Okay, so I'm from Altoona, Pennsylvania. And in Altoona, Pennsylvania, they have something called the Slinky Action Zone. If you did not know, Altoona, Pennsylvania is home of the Slinky. And so we have this... It's like a, it's It's exactly like a Chuck E. Cheese, but it's the Slinky Action Zone. It does not have mascots, though. Does it have pizza? Like It has pizza, it has birthday parties, it has arcade games, it has like a, a jungle gym type thing that's like, uh, it's actually a ton of fun. It basically is like a, a Mario platforming level for little kids. See, now we have to go. We've we've been there and we've never been there. How, how have we not done this? I don't even know if it's still open. Maybe it's truly turned into the Five Nights at Freddy's. Uh, that's also fine. <laughs> <laughs> that's even better. So Five Nights at Freddy's is based around... It's based around... Like a, a kid's party zone where there's animatronics on stage to keep everybody occupied. And I, I think everybody's at least had some thoughts of like, what happens at night with these animatronics? They're really creepy, but what actually happens with these? This, this franchise just kind of takes that idea and runs with it. So the horror is kind of based around like the, uh, the uncanny valley nature of these like humanoid puppets. Yeah. So this started as a video game. This started initially as Scott Cawthon's, like, last-ditch attempt at making a name for himself in the video game industry. The first game had no real intention of becoming the deep lore trap that it has become today. Yeah, I think that's, <laughs> that's a safe bet. So, full disclosure, I actually have played the first video game. By my request. <laughs> yeah, I have not actually completed all Five Nights at Freddy's. It's a pretty famous game. I know I'm probably rehashing this for, for most listeners, but if if you happen to be just a book person who listens to my book podcast, the game gets its name from... It's a point-and-click horror game where you have to survive five nights at the Freddy's, and there's going to be so much disagreement about this. I don't know which pizzeria it is. There, there's several. Fre- Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria is the first game. Okay. Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria. They all sound very similar, but they are all very distinct, and it's important to know which one's which, but I don't. So we're at Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria, and you are a security guard who has to watch the security cameras, and you have to point and click like various locks and, and traps and stuff to keep the animatronics, which stalk the halls of Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria at night, searching for their next victim really searching for their next victim that they're left on roam mode at night so the the gears don't lock up that is actually what 
you find out, I believe, the first or second night through the um, the telephone guy, the answering machine that just kind of explains like the the brief backstory that the first game has. Okay, so it's probably also important to mention that uh, Five Nights at Freddy's is kind of permeated with like a sarcastic humor. Very sarcastic, very dark comedy kind of humor. And so <laughs> it's like there's there's many things in Five Nights at Freddy's where it's like. If you get too close to these animatronics at night while they're in wandering mode, they'll kill you. Oh yeah, absolutely. Like, and and we leave them in wandering mode so the gears don't lock up, even though it's a threat to human life to do so. Yeah, but this is also during a time where, like, if the minimum wage security guard went missing overnight. Oh, and, oh, and it's also important. He is minimum wage. We know that for a fact because people have meticulously analyzed his paycheck. Oh yes, no, absolutely. Like the. <laughs> The web of lore and game theory that goes into this series as a whole is mind-numbing. That's the other thing, is there's there's a whole bunch of lore around who built these animatronics, why they built the animatronics. There is a, a serial killer of children thrown into the mix. Mm-hmm. The animatronics are possessed by the ghosts of murdered children. It's a whole thing. Part of the reason we're here talking about it today on this podcast is because it combines games and books and graphic novels and the advertising and the source code of the website. Graphic novels. Am I missing something? Uh, There's an actual augmented reality game. There's a couple VR games. This game franchise is almost like a beyond augmented reality game. It's, It's like an augmented reality plus game almost. So there's... I just want to make sure we're we're both talking about the same thing. So there's ARG can mean two things. It can mean augmented reality game, which is AR, which is a a kind of VR where it mixes uh, virtual elements with the actual environment around you. So like Pokemon Go has an AR mode where the Pokemon uh, move around in your phone's camera. Mm -hmm. Whereas there's also an ARG alternate reality game where it is a game played in reality with fictional elements. So there, there's many of these on the internet. You can find them. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of some of the the big ones, and I'm totally blanking on it. But essentially... Wasn't, wasn't the Cicada... I feel like the Cicada had was like a big augmented reality, or a big AR kind of game, where they had a bunch of puzzles online that you had to solve, and only like a couple people solved them. Well, I'm thinking there's there's a lot of YouTube channels that wind up being ARGs that have, like, clues all over the place where... But um, you're not ever, like... Usually they don't introduce themselves as ARGs. Yeah. Usu- no, Cicada didn't. I'm actually going to Google that because I feel like I might have the name wrong. Just on the side, I'm, I'm looking up cicadas and there's this thing called Cicada Recipes and I'm not having it. Oh, yeah. The, the uh, 17 year cicadas are out where we live and... It takes somebody 10 seconds to mention that you can eat them. It's disgusting. I don't want to. No, I'm, I'm thinking it's called the uh, Cicada 3301, and it is an ARG, and that's all I've got on it, without, <laughs> without totally just turning this into an episode about Cicada. <laughs> yeah. So part of the reason I wanted to talk to you about this is because um, listeners may be surprised to find out that Bookish as I am, I I am married to somebody who does not really enjoy reading. I don't. I can't sit down to read a book to save my life. I tried. And so part of that is you have you have ADHD, and yeah. so you don't like to just sit still in one place and focus on no on I'm, a non interactive task. For as much as I like good storytelling and. As someone with ADHD, I love a good story. Just sitting there and looking at a page full of full of letters and words, it just makes my brain shut down. And it, it sucks because I do, I do love, like I started reading the novel version of Silver Eyes and I, I took notes. I was like really into it and then my brain just decided we're not having it anymore. So I decided instead of just like throwing it out the window, I moved to the graphic novel. Yeah. When you also interacted with the, um, they, they have more interactive books. I know there's a log book out there or mm-hmm. something like that, where it's, it's a book that 
there there is story elements written in between the lines because it's Five Nights at Friday's, and of course there is. Yep. <laughs> but you can you actually get to solve puzzles within the book. Yeah. So you you're 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 the type of person who who loves puzzles. Oh yeah. No, I. If you looked at my log on my phone, all of the apps I have are puzzle related: escape room, mystery, murder, fantasy, sci-fi, ghost. You name it. If it's a puzzle, I'll do it. Yeah, and so one of the things, I don't know how much we've really talked about it on the podcast yet, but I do think graphic novels count as reading. And, oh, yeah. And I do think, actually, that logbook counts as reading. You engage with it in a, in a slightly different way, but I, I guess we'd have to go into what, what I mean by count and, and all that, and this isn't really the time or the place, but <laughs> this is one of the first bits of, like, I, I guess I'll say, like, the written word mm-hmm. that that you've engaged with because Scott Cawthon is somewhere down somewhere out there hopefully he's writing this story yeah and he knows like he has written a story for people to not necessarily read but consume to interact with yeah and it's almost like reading to the next level because if if part of the intellectual challenge of reading is that you have to take in the words and and imagine them in your mind and like create a scene in your mind with this you have to have all that creativity plus problem solving plus theorizing and interaction with other theorists who are there's a whole community on reddit that's all about Mm -hmm. trying to put these clues together and like you said matt pat has who really hitched his YouTube wagon oh, yeah. to this whole series. And- yeah, Matt, Matt Pat's career like exploded whenever Five Nights at Freddy's really started to take off. If you look at, if you go to his channel, it's like a, a good solid third. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> For any book people who are, who are listening to this, Matt Pat is a YouTuber <laughs> who has, who has a, a YouTube, he has several YouTube channels, but the one we're talking about is, is Game Theory, where he posts mostly nonsensical theories about video games though in the five nights at freddy's case his theories wound up being relevant to very relevant to the actual plot very real scott cawthon himself has like has made like cheeky side comments that were borderline blatant nods to like yes you did it right this time or no you are way off base it's really nice that five nights at freddy's has um, decided to go down the book publishing route. I know it's it's kind of Nate and I have talked on the podcast before about like books as merchandise, and that's kind of what this is. It's kind of like an accessory for a kid who likes Five Nights at Freddy's. It's it's published. I don't know if it's published by Scholastic, but it's definitely a Scholastic book. That logo's on it. I'm guessing your kid can get this at their elementary school book fair if those are still a thing. And I haven't dated myself too much. <laughs> And <laughs> the book is probably targeted at like the um, maybe slightly older than Goosebumps, mm-hmm. Goosebumps audience. So it's like people die in the book. Yep. So I don't think anybody ever dies in Goosebumps, or if they do, it's off screen hundreds of years ago or something. Like yeah, Goosebumps deals with ghosts, but very rarely does anyone in the cast die. Yeah. So that this this deals with murder and particularly the murder of children. So it's a little bit more intense, but I, I'd say the, the gore factor is... The gore factor in the first book is relatively low. Especially, like, you only really see anything really quote-unquote gory at the end of the book. Spoiler alert. Um, yeah, I, I'd say the third <clears throat> act yeah. is where it starts to get gory. Uh, somebody does get stabbed. Like that's the kind of level of gore we're talking. Somebody yeah. gets stabbed and they bleed, and yeah. so that that could be a little too much for some kids, I guess. But I would say by like sixth grade or so, if you're watching action movies and stuff, yeah, that, that's kind of the level. Like if, we're if your with. kids have seen an Avengers movie, they're probably ready to see Five Nights at Freddy's. Yeah, yeah, I'll give you that. <laughs> this this skirts a lot of lines of like it's it's too old for. Elementary school kids, I would say, but it also... I'm going to say, I'll throw this out there, 12 to like 16. Yeah. Like that middle school, you're really starting to like yeah. become the young adult you're about to become. Yeah, it doesn't rise to the level of adult fiction, though I, I enjoyed the book. I yeah. Mean, 
but I was very aware I was reading a book for kids. The the writing is straightforward, simple, not a lot of big words, not a lot of like nuance or anything. They 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 keep it very clear, easy to understand. I would definitely say though, even though it is of like a younger writing style, the author did a really good job of also making the characters feel like real kids. Yeah, I, I definitely think you can tell it's it's a it's not written for kids by a kid, but it's written for kids to understand as kids. Just because it's for kids doesn't mean it's bad. Yeah, um, it's just for kids. I wouldn't hold that against it or the author. The author is the author is clearly making a calculated decision to yeah. simplify the writing for children. I definitely say like for for people who are well read but like a good a good simple mystery, I'd say this would be a light read for somebody like Ben who reads often. For someone like me, it's a challenge, but only to sit down and actually do it. I can I burned through a good solid third of the book without even trying. Before my brain finally decided, no, we're ha- we're done having having these words in our face. But for me, that's impressive. Making it through a third of anything before my ADHD just says we're done. Like that's pretty okay. Yeah, I read it in about eight hours, and it took me about eight hours to get through a third of the book. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, I'm not flexing. I I don't actually read that quick. I think we we kind of want to talk about comparing and contrasting the text of the book to the graphic novel. Yeah. As we go through, there's some discrepancies between the book and the graphic novel. Mm -hmm. And the book came first, right? Yes, the book absolutely came first. Okay. So is the graphic novel like an adaptation of the book? Yes. It's supposed to be, but there are some things about the artist of the graphic novel that should be stated about the graphic novel before we really even go into it, because it's... I, I don't know how to say... If you don't know anything about Pinky Pills and how this is her first work, you're going to see that the graphic novel is kind of Rough. lacking. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what I was going to say is I think where they differ, if you're a Five Nights at Freddy's lore fanatic, where they differ, uh, defer to the book. Like yes. To me, I think the <laughs> book is the authoritative source. Yes. The graphic novel is an adaptation. Yes. So... I guess, should we call her Pinky Pills? Pinky Pills is what I just called her because I, I'm i terrible with, like, regular names. Her name is Claudia Schroeder. The artist of the graphic novel, who I assume is... Well, Scott Cawthon is given giving a writing credit on the graphic novel as well, I think. Mm. Yep. Is Kira Breed Risley given a writing credit on the graphic novel? Yes. Okay. So, I think we can definitely assume that the graphic novel is an adaptation of the book. Mm-hmm. And I'm guessing here, but I'm guessing Kira Breed Risley did not write the script. I get the vibe that Pinky Pills... Yeah, no, it says adapted and illustrated by Claudia Schroeder. Okay, so so Claudia Schroeder, a.k.a. Pinky Pills. I'll, I'll get to why we're calling her that in a second. Um, she wrote... She, she took the book and turned it into a comic script and illustrated it. And... Yeah. So... The, the choices of, of what winds up on the page is up to Claudia Schroeder, a.k.a. Mm-hmm. Pinky Pills. Yes. The reason we're calling her Pinky Pills is because that is her screen name. Like her artist name. Yeah, yeah, I shouldn't say screen name. It's it's what she does most of her... What work. of her professional work under. Yeah. She does a lot of work with Scott Cawthon on the Five Nights at Freddy's games with character design and illustration... And when it comes to her character design and illustration, she's phenomenal. She's great. Yeah, from what I've seen, she's she's a digital artist who primarily does illustration. This seems like it mm-hmm. might have been her first, maybe this, only foray into actual like comic yes, book. Yes, this is her her from what I understand her first attempt at comic book art and comic book creating. And for someone who has who has consumed a lot of comic books and like manga and all sorts of graphic novels. You, you get the feel that she has a good understanding. Like she's not trained in it. Yeah. So I was going to, I was going to talk about that real quick. So we haven't gotten a chance to talk about 
graphic novels on the podcast very much, but it is something I'm super into. The The discipline of like comic booking is referred to as sequential art. And that is arranging images in a sequence to tell a story, um, which is a little bit different from illustration where the static image itself sort of tells a story or communicates something. From what I've seen of, of Claudia Schroeder's portfolio and her concept art on Five Nights at Freddy's and other games, she's a really good illustrator. Some of the choices in the comic are a little odd to me. It, it's just, it's very f- flat. Like the... Like, you, you'll understand where things are going, but there are definitely things that are missing or could have been done differently. Well, so it's kind of like film language. So, for example, say uh, a, a close-up is meant to get very personal. And a a Dutch angle is meant to show that what's happening is unnerving or off kilter. It's not quite right. There's a similar second language to comic booking. And that is sort of what the graphic novel lacks. It's not that the illustrations are bad by any stretch. It's just that they, they don't make the most of the medium. Yeah. Uh, so that would be the, like the main criticism of the comic I have. It doesn't have the same flow and emotional buildup and key points that a comic book normally has. Let's jump into the story a little bit. Yes. Let's, let's talk about it. So the main character in the story is Charlie, who is not a security guard at a pizzeria. That is correct. Charlie is actually a young teenage woman. How does the graphic novel start? The graphic novel starts actually with a flashback to, well, I guess you would say a flash forward to the end of the book. Yeah. Okay. So that's how the book starts as well. So, so it's a, a scene of like, it's, it's, they're kind of doing that, that thing you see in movies where there's like the present moment where like your main character is in, like is in utter danger at their lowest point. Mm -hmm. And then it, it's like. Three days previous. Yep. (laughs) So Charlie's driving back home to attend the anniversary and I guess establishment ceremony for a scholarship in the honor of a childhood friend of hers who was kidnapped and is presumed dead. Yes. And we will find out as we go along that this child was kidnapped from... Oh, Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria. Which is where the first game takes place? Uh, it's like Chuck E. Cheese. You have, like, all the Chuck E. Cheeses, and they all have the same name. Okay, I see. So there's no way to know. There is a way to know, but we're not here for that right now. The first game... <laughs> <laughs> we're just opening too big a can of worms there. <laughs> it's, it's too big. We don't have the economy size can opener to open this can right now. <laughs> okay. So I think the books are also kind of meant to establish a, a, a new canon. Or... They're, um, they're meant to kind of help tie some of the facts between some of the games together. There's a very complicated timeline. The games come out out of order sequentially. Like, in, within their own universe's timeline. And then the books came out, and they kind of smooth over some of, like, the the early middle timeline. So it all starts in the early 80s. This takes place in the late 80s, early 90s. And I think the most recent game that is to come out is going to take place close to present day. There are so many things going on in this world right now, Ben. I can't keep track. (laughs) So her friend disappeared from a pizzeria. Pizzeria, we will later find out, is owned by Charlie's dad. Father, yes. On the way to meet up with her friends, who are also going to be attending this ceremony, Charlie stops off at her house. Her Her, childhood home. Her childhood home that her aunt... Who is, who is raising Charlie. So mm-hmm. we assume something happened to Charlie's parents, but we don't know quite what yet. Yeah, we're not there yet. Charlie's aunt has purchased this house. She's continued to make payments on the house while Charlie was growing up. Charlie is 17, by the way, I think we mm-hmm. should say. So Charlie's a junior in high school. They're all juniors in high school. They're all the same age. All the kids. So she goes back to this house. 
it's hinted that Charlie doesn't really understand why her aunt even bothered paying off the house and keeping the house. Yeah, Charlie Charlie doesn't understand exactly why anyone would want to do that. But uh, that, that was the first um, alarm bell in my mind. Because I, at the end of this book, we'll talk about, I suspect the aunt knows more than she has mentioned. I, I believe her name's what, Aunt Jen. She, she's far smarter than what she's letting on. Yeah. So Charlie goes to the house, and she's walking around, and it's creepy. Nothing's been touched since Charlie left in a hurry one day. Yeah, about 10 years ago. Yeah, the, the, her aunt came and told her, pack a bag, you're going to stay with me for a little while, we'll come back for the rest of your stuff later, and they never came yeah, back. Later never came. Yeah. So all of Charlie's stuff is still there, all of the family stuff is still there, and it's all just been collecting dust. And as she goes upstairs uh, into her room, we see that Charlie's dad used to make her all of these little mini animatronics. These little robotic, creepy dolls, and some of them still kind of work. Like all creepy, animatronic anythings. Yeah, and they're all kind of, you know, rotted from time and and lack of care and some of them have like oh half their face covering fell off and and if you're familiar with the five nights at freddy's games this is where it's like okay well i don't i don't like this this is building some suspense because nothing good ever happens with these rotting animatronics i don't like that what's gonna come at you now surprisingly nothing yet nothing yet but it's a very suspenseful scene I don't know if this happens in the book, but in the graphic novel, there is a a brief scene where they cut back to Charlie sitting in like a workshop with the silhouette of a man, which you would assume is her dad. In the book, she has she's she's flashing back between the present and the past the whole time. Nothing winds up happening to Charlie. Things start to get dark, and Charlie, much like me, the reader, thinks that this house looks very different at night. And not nearly as welcoming. <laughs> <laughs> and that Charlie could, of course, stay in this house, which she technically owns while she's in town. Yep. But she is instead going to stay at a motel. Yep, with her friends. With her friends. Yep. She goes to a diner mm-hmm. to meet up with her friends who are already in town. I think, what, uh, let me let me try to remember who's at the diner. It is Charlie, Jess, John... And Carlton. Yes. All right. (laughs) I remember all these kids' names so far. (laughs) That's the downside of having to read so many books so fast. (laughs) I read this uh, maybe three weeks ago. Yep, and in less in about less than a day. And that was that was three books ago too. (laughs) That's the podcast. Oh, but um. So she meets up with them. She hasn't seen any of them in years. And mm-hmm. this is one strength of the book, I think. Kira Breed Risley really does a good job of that that awkward meeting between childhood friends who haven't seen each other uh, for most of their formative years. Mm-hmm. Um, you feel like you should connect, like you feel like your best friend from second grade should still be your best friend. But they really are a completely different person now. Yep. And you don't know if you'll still click yeah still like each other even and yeah they're all brought back at the request of their former friend i mean their dead friend's parents uh to attend this event and they all feel understandably a little awkward about it mm-hmm. they're not really sure what they're supposed to do they're not really sure how to handle it and it's like you said that's where she does a good job of really channeling the fact that these are teenagers they're there's they've ex- they've experienced more than anybody should ever have to but at the same time you still get the idea that they're kids yeah and I, I the, you get the idea that they're at that they're at that turning point where they they're society's starting to expect them to be adults. Yeah. But they don't really know how to be adults yet. It's that it's that awkward intermediate period. But they also, because of what they've been through, and because of the town they're in especially, they're also still kind of looked at as those poor, you know, kids that lost their friend. They're in that in that in that spot between 
Well, they're in a small town where this is yeah. huge news. Everybody knows who they are, yeah. uh, even if even if they don't remember who everybody else is. Yeah, everybody and, knows that. Like all the adults in the town know that these kids suffered a huge tragedy at this place, and they're the author does a very good job of making you realize that these are kids, but they're also about to become adults, but they're also having to deal with this huge event one last time. Or so you think. Yeah, ideally. <laughs> <laughs> so that brings us to another interesting point. We find out that Carlton is uh, the only person who has remained in this town. Yes. And he does at some point in the book, not here, but I'm, just going to jump ahead a little. He points out at some point that it's strange that, or somebody points out at some point that it's strange that so many literally of the, what is it? Six of them who are invited to the ceremony. Mm -hmm. Only one of them uh, remained in town. Yeah. Which is, it's unheard of for this small town. People who are born here or who come here tend to stay here the rest of their lives. Yeah. And for all six people to have moved out, is very odd and it does hint that this event affected their families more than you realize yeah their families wanted to get out they wanted yeah. to get their children out yes so the diner scene quickly establishes some of the dynamics in the group jess is a pretty fashionista yeah she, she's the one who's bound for new york and to be a a runway fashion designer and um John is supposed to be the next... I don't remember. Does he want to be a journalist or a flat-out author? Author, because he's got a short story published. Ah, that's right. Yes, so he, I, I paid close attention to that. Because you connected with him on a personal level? Not at all. <laughs> I have never been so arrogant as to assume I will be an author. Oh, Benjamin. John is also the love interest. Yeah. yeah. Ish. <laughs> John has a love interest. I don't know if it's reciprocated. <laughs> it's reciprocated, and it's the most frustrating thing if anybody wants to get in this for the romance, these two seriously are just the most impossible couple ever. Yeah, it's a real Rachel and Ross situation. You shot. want them to be together, but... <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's a, that's a I whole didn't aside. Really, I didn't know if Charlie was into it. I kind of wanted John to back off a little bit. Oh, Charlie's into it. I But I've read more. I've read f ahead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm not getting the vibe at all that Charlie's into it because half the time she's like, I really wish he wouldn't right now. In the graphic novel, you don't get that at all. In the graphic, in the next book, however, when they're when they're college adults, you really just want to smash their heads together and say kiss already. I'll take your word for it. <laughs> I'll, I'll read the next book. Well, I'm still not sure that that relationship is is canon. I don't know, Ben. <laughs> I don't know. I don't like John that much. But, uh... <laughs> Then we get to Carlton, who uh, is, of course, uh, the townie, and he's kind of the most mature, the most, well, I don't know about most mature, but he's the most outwardly mature. He's good at talking to adults. He might even have dreams of, like, being a politician or something like that. And his dad is a uh, cop, the chief cop. Yeah, he's the chief of police in, in the same town that he's spent his whole life in, which is why he's good at dealing with adults. <laughs> you gotta be good with adults if your dad's a cop. They all look at Carlton after after the awkward mention of the night that their friend had disappeared and the pizzeria. Oh yeah, they're all curious. Is it still there? What do yeah. you know, Carl? And he's, he's like, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I just, I just live here. Well, he rightly points out, I don't go out of my way to drive past one of my one of my worst memories. He does say that there was something going on up there, but he doesn't really know what it was. Yeah, and they decide to go check it out. I think they take two cars. It, a lot of attention is paid in the book to who's in what car. Uh, it never really matters, but... Yeah, it, that's the one... They, <laughs> they don't mention that in, in It's in the a big graphic. deal for teenagers, so I guess it does make sense. Who gets to ride with who? Like, Yeah. I'm going to date I, myself here, but it's like your top eight on MySpace. <laughs> <laughs> they go out to the location of the former pizzeria where it all went wrong, and they find that there is a giant mall that has been built there. A giant abandoned mall. Yes, it was like somebody started construction on it, got 90% finished. They were so far as to have people or or companies lined up ready to go into the shops of the mall and people started backing out once they realized where the mall was being built. Yes. Being teenagers, they decide to poke around where they're not wanted. 
go into the mall. I'm trying to remember the... the well, they would have gotten away with it, too, if it weren't for you. Scooby-Doo. Yeah. Hey, uh, <laughs> what did I say? You didn't say anything. Oh, damn. You said, I'm trying to remember, and then you referenced Scooby-Doo <laughs> as if you couldn't remember it. Uh, yeah, I was trying to remember who it was that I was trying to reference and what it was I was trying to say. <laughs> my, my brain just went full stop on that. So they go into the mall, and as they're walking in... Meddling kids. That's what I was trying to think of. <laughs> So as they're going into the mall, they notice a security guard. A flashlight bobbing up and down, following them. And they run. And they run into this store that that isn't fully built yet. And they run all the way to the back of it. And they hide while the security guard goes past. And it doesn't look like they've been spotted. Good times. Then they notice that beside them... Uh, is a half-finished wall, and they can kind of squeeze in between, like there's a gap between where the store wall ends and the actual outside of the building. Yeah. And going down that back, they spot the back door to Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria. Oh my god! It's still there. They just built the mall around it for some reason. It's like some kind of crazy cultists. Okay. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> that, that, that becomes relevant far later in the series. In more recent game... Uh, what's the word I was looking for? Uh, installments. Alrighty. So they, they found it. The old pizzeria is still there. It was not destroyed. And naturally, they gotta break in. Of course. It's what any... That's what any rational person would do. Honestly, I would at this point. I, Me too. I would one hundred percent. As someone who would live, breathe, and die in Fallout, I would absolutely just go in and plunder the heck out of that place. Okay, I wasn't gonna rob it, but I would. <laughs> <laughs> it's not robbing it if it's closed down. I bet there's a lot of copper wiring in here. Heck yeah! <laughs> See that adhesive? <laughs> What? You need a lot of adhesive in the wasteland. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if Fallout has quite prepared you for life in the way that you think it has. No, it hasn't. <laughs> I would die quickly. So they break in at night. Which is a terrible time to break into anywhere. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Arguably the best time to break in. Broad daylight. You know. Broad daylight's probably the worst time. <laughs> you know, when they're open, I guess it's not really breaking in. Exactly. <laughs> it's just whatever you got to do to like spice up your grocery shopping. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> breaking into the store in the middle of the afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> They'll never know. <laughs> I'm just gonna go ahead and pay at the self checkout. <laughs> They'll never catch me. <laughs> I'm the tender vigilante. <laughs> I'm the chicken tender vigilant. <laughs> okay. They break in, they look around. They find all the animatronics, all the ones from the games. Ooh! They're on stage like you would expect any animatronic mascot would be. So it's basically they do the thing from the game. They yeah. find the control rooms, where, which is where you play the game. It's where you yeah. do the point and click. This is basically the MacGuffin that leads you to like the scene where everybody's like, Oh, oh there it is. I yeah, see they're it. They're like, oh, no, there she is. You got to follow them around and mm-hmm. you gotta push the buttons and do the things. So they can make the animatronics move and such. There's there's buttons. They haven't gotten that far yet. Oh, they don't get that far this night? Not, not the first night. I see. So they look around, they find out it's all still there. It's very tension building, very spooky, because we, the readers, su- pr- probably are supposed to know that... This is this is the place where things are going to go down. Yeah, that these animatronics are bad news. Yeah. There is, of course, a picture of Freddy Fazbear on the cover of the book with his glowing red eyes. So y- you know it's bad times. Yeah. <laughs> but then they, they escape and they go back to their hotels and they... Get ready to attend a memorial service. Yeah. How uplifting. It's probably the last time things will ever seem normal for him, actually. (laughs) (laughs) Little little did they know that that was as good as it ever got. So that was the first night at Freddy's. Yes, that was the first night at Freddy's. Day two is whenever... um, Who is it? Lamar and... Oh, what's this lady's name? Oh, dang. 
Marla, her little brother Jason. Is, is it really Lamar and Marla? Uh, I believe Lamarla. So. Yeah. Because Lamar is crushing on Marla. Uh. He is. I remember this. Is he? Yes. In the next book, he has a crush on Charlie. Oh, they have to do a little Edward and Jacob thing. They're going to the same college. I don't oh, know. Oh yeah. I just, I just I just live here, Ben. Okay. <laughs> The Five Nights at Freddy's love triangle that everybody wanted. <laughs> I ain't, I ain't mad about it. <laughs> okay, so yeah, Marla shows up. She's kind of like dead mother. She she's she's the overexcited, over touchy, hug me, I love you, friend that everybody has. And she brought her little brother Jason, who is like the most little brothery little brother he, that has ever littled and he, brothered. He, he's the one who walks around with the Game Boy and the snotty nose and is like, "I'm a big boy." Baby doo ba doo. That's exactly what he says. <laughs> Lamar is an engineering student. He's skeptic. He's got a rational explanation for everything. Uh-huh. Cuz it's a horror book. There's got to be one of those. There's always one. There's always one. I can logic this away in no time. I will say, I will say, none of the main characters in this book die, which is a good thing. Okay. But that's also a bad thing. Go on. Because one of the main characters at the end of the book should have died. But you'll find out who that main character is later. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. There's so much intrigue. (laughs) So they attend the funeral service. Not the funeral service. Oh my (laughs) gosh. They attend the memorial service. Good lord. Pretty well written scene. Uh, She really conveys kind of the trauma that these parents went through. Pretty realistic depiction of what something like this might happen. So at the memorial service, the parents are establishing uh, a scholarship in their son's name. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it is is a scholarship for, uh, I guess, kids who want to go to school for art because their their son was a a budding artist. Mm -hmm. And... They wanted his friends to be there to see it, and they were all kind of worried that they would have to speak, but they didn't really know, and it surprises all of them when the parents actually introduce Carlton, and he does give a speech, and he gives a pretty good speech, actually, Um, and it kind of reveals that Carlton, at first, Carlton's kind of like, I, I, I said politician, he's kind of got that... Not necessarily like like that kind of salesman vibe where he's he's not sincere in a lot of the things he's saying. But then he gives this speech. Yeah. And it, it does feel very sincere. And yeah. you can tell that he was actually maybe building some emotional walls around himself. Yeah. Well, and they do mention later, I don't feel bad spoiling this now. Like they do mention later in the book that Carlton was a bit of a a prankster. Which would absolutely explain, like, he's, like, putting up these walls because he's, like, trying to keep everybody away. This disappearance... It really, it really messed with him. Yeah. When his friend was taken, it really... Yeah. He never recovered from that. He's actually pretty traumatized by it. Yeah. I really like the way this played out in the book is that Charlie almost kind of feels like an outsider being here. Mm -hmm. And it, it is one of those moments where, like, you're... You're deeply in touch with grief, and like even though you were invited there, they wanted you to be there. You're like you're you're not the person you were. You yeah. don't really f- you feel like the older Charlie should be there, but you are just a stranger intruding on these people's most vulnerable moments. And yeah, the book does a really good job of conveying that feeling, and I have experienced that feeling many times. I like I don't do like viewings and stuff. They're always it, 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 it always feels wrong. Yeah, it it feels like I shouldn't. Not that I sh- don't deserve to be here, but I don't necessarily belong to belong here. There's just so many complicated emotions. Yeah. And, and I think the book does a good job of conveying that yeah. to, to a younger audience. The, the parents say something about, it's not just about Michael, but also the other families who are suffering and the other kids. Yes, this is where they they hint that there were... There were other families at the time of Michael's disappearance that had also had children go missing, but these yes. other families couldn't or didn't want to be there. But this this was 
the scholarship was in Michael's name, but was in all of these children's honor and memory. Yeah, so now we know that Michael's not the only victim. Yeah, this was actually a serial kidnapping. They assume they never found bodies. I think everybody assumes the kids are dead. Everybody assumes that they're dead. But when it when a case for a kidnapping goes cold without a body, they sort of leave it up to... Well, I mean, I know, like, obviously the parents have complicated feelings about this. Yeah. And you wouldn't want to say that to them. But, like, well, it's strongly they, implied they, that... I will say, for, from, from someone who's watched a lot of cold case files, they do a good job of, even though they all know and assume that these kids are dead, they know that they're cold cases. Yeah. They've never been solved, so they still have to say that they're potentially missing. Yeah. Okay. They walk around town, but then yeah. they do go back to Charlie's house. Yeah. I'm skipping over the, the town part because I don't... Yeah. I'm not that invested in Charlie and John's romance. <laughs> they have a romantic walk. Yeah. But I've got four more nights at Freddy's to get through here, so we're moving along. <laughs> They go back to Charlie's house again. She shows John the animatronics and they poke around in her dad's workshop. Mm -hmm. And I know at this point we mentioned the silver eyed animatronic. John has a flashback to the day that Michael disappeared. And that triggers a memory from Charlie. All he remembers is that he saw a golden mascot costume with these human but soulless silver eyes that peered right down at him. Silver eyes. So, mm-hmm. Interesting. I, I guess I didn't catch... They, they might not have mentioned the color in the book. In the graphic novel, they make it a point to give him these grayish silver eyes. They may have said gray. I know he, he describes them as being like a zombies almost, like they're dead, like that kind of yeah. white contact. Yeah. But let's talk about what these stupid animatronics are. Sorry, what these animatronics are. <laughs> <laughs> this is the only part of the book where I think the writing is, is not clear. Mm-hmm. John is talking about what he saw. And so there was a moment during the day, and this is the moment where Michael gets snatched, where all the animatronics bug out. Yeah. They all start having, like, weird malfunctions on stage. During that moment, John looks beside him, and there is a yellow version of the Freddy animatronic, the bear. The Fred bear, yep. Standing there. And Golden he lo- Freddy. And he looks in and he sees the eyes. And so I was confused as to, like, why would an animatronic be standing next to him? Like these these animatronics also double as like like mascot, costumes, mascot yeah. costumes. Yeah, like it, they they're described later as spring lock me- mechanisms that you can hold back the animatronic parts with, so the human can climb inside. That is why you see the golden Fred bear with human eyes, but then later you can see him with actual animatronic eyes. So had this been mentioned in the games before these books came out? Yes, I believe so. Okay. Cause I had no idea what was going on up until this point. They have never referred to these things as anything other than animatronics. Yeah. So when you, when you see somebody like, when like, I see oh. somebody like walking around as one, I was wondering why nobody thought that was weird. No, because they have the, Used to have people do it all the time. So they used to have people wander the restaurant and like interact with kids and stuff, do the Disneyland thing. And also, it is canon that these animatronics in particular had a free roam mode at one point. And that's why they need to be able to move around at night to let their gears stay loose. But this location shut down and it's... The justifications surrounding (laughs) these animatronics are like comedically flimsy. Yeah. (laughs) Fred Durst. Ew. <laughs> this is as good a time as any to talk about what a spring lock suit is. Yeah, I just told you. you, you yeah, lo- yeah, but for somebody who hadn't known anything about Five Nights at Freddy's, like, let me just reiterate what Shy said. So, these suits, because you said it in a way that, like, oh, yeah, of course, that's well, just, just a logical just thing. Sense. Yeah, no. <laughs> so, these suits, uh, apparently, like, they have, like, the animatronic skeleton inside, like, the actual mm-hmm. robotics yes. that make it move. That can somehow retract... To where we know not. But it's, it's sort of sort of like um, snakes' uh, fangs, you know, the safe s- snake fang just retracts back into its 
jaw, you can push these okay, so sharp there's... ribs and things into little... Okay, so the skeleton can... We're going to say shrink. It, it can, it can like, fold itself and compress. And then when it's folded up and compressed, that is all locked with a spring lock. Mm-hmm. And I don't think... Th- they use the term spring lock the way most of us would use the term spring lock? No. In in the Five Nights at Freddy's universe, a spring lock is like a very deadly, dangerous device that is on a hair trigger. It is the most fragile lock imaginable. <laughs> that is ready to like snap at the slightest touch. Literally. With the force that can break bones. With the force of a feather landing on a soft winter night. <laughs> yeah, that's just... It takes nothing at all for these. Oh, no, I was talking about the force that they close with. Oh, no, that's the force of an angry hippo on yeah, a rampage. Yeah, yeah, no, you're talking about the force to set them off. Yeah, it? no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you, if you, have you ever seen a watermelon get destroyed by a hippopotamus? That times 100. <laughs> the natural example. <laughs> so, so, yeah, just hold that image in your head of a, of a hippo. Exploding watermelon bits everywhere. Yeah, that's what will happen to the human inside this suit should the spring lock fail which let's be it's pro- it probably will yeah yeah cuz it canonically it happens frequently <laughs> yeah so that that's the sarcastic humor of the five nights at freddy's games is that they they just don't care about their employees like, oh yeah that's the best part that's they, literally the best part it it's hinted that they they kill their employees constantly <laughs> Yeah, in the games, whenever you hear the, whenever you go to a new night and you hear the the voicemail guy give his spiel, there's usually some kind of hint that either he's in danger, the person you're replacing was killed, or the you're potentially going to be killed. So one of the interesting things, though, is that um, I guess as the lore has developed, mm-hmm. the book has none of that sarcastic humor. No, the book is actually surprisingly serious. For... It is trying to play this, like, deadly straight. Yes. And that kind of... <laughs> the book deals with these comedic... These comedically dangerous... Robots? S- spring trap suits. Yes. By glossing over it as fast as possible. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, like, my God, yeah. It's a spring lock. It's a spring trap suit. It's a totally normal thing to do. Very logical. Makes, makes total sense. Forget about it. Don't think about it. Forget about it. Yeah. It's just... That's just... That's just what happens in this world. Just forget about it. That's... Just just consider it normal. One would wonder if Charlie's dad is such a good guy. Mm-hmm. Why did he build these over-the-top violent suits with no safety mechanisms? No habla inglés, señor. <laughs> so... Well, after they have their little awkward teenage moment, they all go back to Freddy's now that the rest of the gang is there. Now that they've got Lamar, Marla, and Jason. Oh, that's right. They don't go to the diner that night. They agreed to meet up there. Yeah. This is when they find the control rooms and start playing with the animatronics. Right. They find out they can make a move. And mm-hmm. this is also where Jason finds the papers. The, yes. The, the drawings. Yep. So, yeah, Jason sees these drawings... They, they, I guess they used to put up drawings that kids did of the mascots and stuff. Mm-hmm. And one of them, Jason, thinks he sees a kid hugging the rabbit, Bonnie. Yep. But what is actually happening, it seems to change in front of his eyes. And he realizes what he's looking at is the, the kid is facing the wrong way. The kid is trying to get away and Bonnie is grabbing them. Yep, yep. And because Jason is around the age of like the the typical missing child from the michael case he's of course going to be the only one that sees this meanwhile all the teenagers are playing hide and go seek yeah well they're all doing various things yeah john and charlie are playing hide and go seek yeah and charlie's really bad at it (laughs) trying to keep away from him benjamin (laughs) charlie keeps remembering her dad working on the silver dyed animatronic right Yes. I got the impression that animatronic that he was working on was Foxy. They don't put as much emphasis on it being Foxy in the graphic novels. They just put emphasis on it being the endoskeleton of an animatronic. So I guess I'll ask you now, does Foxy have any prominent... Before I spend so much time going down this Foxy line, because I thought it was Foxy, I thought Foxy was super important. 
I thought it was like they constantly seem to be calling attention to Foxy. Like he's in the Pirates Cove, which was under construction the entire time. Like nobody ever saw Foxy. He's he's this weird character that's not part of the main three. And I thought they were making Foxy out to be a big deal. Is Foxy a big deal? <laughs> you don't really find out anything in this book about fi- about Foxy being a big deal or not. I'm looking for a spoiler. Is Foxy a big deal? Kind of not. Okay. Wh- what what a red herring. <laughs> You're like- also asking somebody who hasn't finished the third book in this series yet. Like, I, I could be wrong. All right. Because it... I, like I still have to get through what is it the twisted ones, or no uh, I have to I have to read the fourth closet, the fourth closet is the last one, but they haven't released the graphic novel for that yet so I'm slug I'm slugging my way through the, the regular book. <laughs> we'll see if the if the if the listeners want to hear more I will go ahead and read the rest of these Five Nights at Freddy's books so we can we can. Continue. I will say I will say Foxy is is a relevant figure in the second book. I feel like Foxy's important. I'm theorizing here. I'm getting caught up in the lore. This is how easy it is. Yeah. (laughs) I feel like Foxy's got a role to play. So Charlie is hiding next to Foxy in the Pirate Cove. That's what reminded me about this. Yes. And Foxy's hook comes down. Yeah. And scrapes Charlie. In the book, it's more implied that, like, Charlie gets spooked by Foxy because... Charlie turns around and like, oh crap, there's the glint of light that caught Foxy and she just kind of fell out of Pirate's Cove and scraped her hand. So what happens specifically in the book is the hook scrapes Foxy or the the hook scrapes Foxy. The hook (laughs) scrapes Charlie and one of the kids who is playing with the controls for the animatronics apologizes saying he must have pushed the wrong button. Oh yeah, I see it. We don't know if he pushed the wrong button or if Foxy moved on his own. Yeah. Ooh. I suspect Foxy moved on his own. The other thing is when they're pushing the buttons to the animatronics, they can't figure out how to make them move. Move the way they remember. Yeah, move the right way. So that that's important. Just put a pin in that. So, so Charlie gets cut. They decide it's time to go. Now they go back to the hotel for their... Or the, the motel for their... Oh, co-ed sleepover. <laughs> yes, because once once again, John has horned his way in. So Charlie tries to sneak out in the morning to go for a walk. Yep. And John is right there. <laughs> yeah, John John is on that. Oh, they're both sitting outside being awkward teenagers. And Charlie starts talking about how she remembers... Like, she remembers having dreams about... The Golden Bonnie and the Golden Freddy suits. She, she remembers her twin brother. <gasps> That's right. We figure out that Charlie had a twin brother. And the fact that Charlie does not remember having a twin brother means... Or that she... You know, obviously the twin brother is not there. So something must have happened to the twin brother. And her parents... It happened young enough that I guess her parents tried to keep it a secret from her. Sort of. That's the implication. Yeah. Charlie doesn't know why she was like, why does nobody talk about this? Why doesn't she know more about this? And you also find out later that Charlie actually has, she has no contact with her parents and her aunt Jen is probably on strict orders to keep her mouth shut. Oh, there's definitely like, this is where we find out something real sketchy is going on with Charlie's family beyond just, just like the weird Freddy... Well, beyond just that the disappearance happened at her father's restaurant. Yeah. So this is when Charlie and John... This is when they go to find the very first place yeah. that her dad and her dad's partner opened, the Fred Bear's family diner. God damn it. <laughs> and there's the name change. There's the first location. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we had to change the name ever so slightly. Lest anyone confuse us for that restaurant where bad things happened. Yep. So Charlie has memories of her brother and they were both playing together in this other restaurant. So Mm -hmm. conveniently, though, I guess it does make sense. um, She she's trying to remember where the restaurant was. And John (laughs) looking for an opportunity to hang out. I know I'm making fun of him, but like John is like, he's curious, too. And he 
Charlie's the main character, but John is the main plot driver. Pun intended, because there's a lot of him driving around in the story. John. <laughs> I, oh, boy. I don't... I dare not... I dare not <laughs> stoke this fandom, but John is is like if Watson had a crush on Sherlock. We can't... <laughs> we can't say for sure he didn't. <laughs> okay, Chef. <sure. laughs> they miraculously they do find the pizzeria. I'm gonna I'm gonna yeah. spare you the the details of that vision quest. But they find the old diner, and yep. it is abandoned. Absolutely abandoned, semi boarded up as an abandoned place in the middle of Utah would be. And when Charlie goes in, they start looking around. Mm-hmm. Charlie finds a closet. She opens it and kind of like is drawn to it and it sparks the memory of actually witnessing her brother getting snatched by the Golden Bonnie. Yes. Yeah. So she has that vivid memory mm-hmm. of somebody in, in, a, in a yellow rabbit suit yes. grabbing her brother and walking away. Never take your children to see the Easter Bunny, especially if he's in a golden suit. You know, I'm not going to lie to you. I was uh, I was driving around on Easter. I had kind of forgotten it was Easter. And I kept seeing people in rabbit suits. I eventually <laughs> did figure out it was Easter. But there were so many people in rabbit suits. I was very confused. That's that's like that's like a FNAF nightmare. <laughs> the one thing that is kind of funny is like, do you think Charlie is being led to these conclusions? Or that she's just conveniently having memory flashbacks? I think it's... I think it's a little bit of both. Because we do know ghosts are a thing. Yeah. Like, in in this universe, like, ghosts and, like, spiritual, or spiritually charged things are a thing. You don't know it quite yet in this book, but, again, that's the great FNAF draw is you know a thing now and you find out the answer later, but it draws more questions that have answers in the previous things and... It's just a mess. <laughs> it's just a mess. <laughs> so this is this is they they immediately cut to night three. Yeah, and now they meet the security guard. Right. Okay. This is where what's his name? Dave comes into play. Dave. Good old Dave. They go back. They sneak in. They're being they're being super careful. And when they get to Freddy's, the guard's right there, and he's like, "I knew you'd be back." I mean, obviously, we knew he'd be back. We knew they'd be back, but how's this guy? How's this guy even guarding an abandoned mall? Why do they have a security guard in a, at an abandoned mall in the first place? Because people like you keep trying to steal stuff, Shy. Uh, you know, you know what, Ben? You know what? It's abandoned. It's 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 it's, it's free not, enterprise. It's not abandoned. It's free enterprise. It's free enterprise. <laughs> it's not abandoned. <laughs> Apparently, if there's a security guard, it is not abandoned. Why is nobody there? Anyway, we're now we're just getting into weird. Yeah, now we're just splitting legal hairs. <laughs> now we're just trying to justify my behavior. I mean, <laughs> they talk and they like Dave. Dave threatens to call the cops on him, and everybody's getting a weird vibe from Dave. Dave has like two deep scars along his jugulars. Yeah, you oh, I see, guess, I guess only one of them is the jugular. The other one's what the aorta. Either way, he's got some nasty scars and some nasty places. I wish Nate were here because then he could tell me because I'm pretty sure blood goes in the head one way and comes out the other. Yeah. I'm not a doctor. Jugular aorta. Your yeah. aorta is attached yeah, the, here. The point is, uh, he's got he's got deep cuts on both of the both of the cords you need. Both of the cords. For your uh your your blood brain. Medically accurate, yes. Yep. <laughs> That's important. That's important. So uh, Charlie, Charlie decides she's going to ask this dude to, why don't you just come in with us? And then you yeah. can make sure we don't do anything. Yeah. Cause that's Cause totally that's th- normal. Yeah. That's a thing anyone would ask. Any teenager would be like, do you want to come join us on, on our illegal shenanigans, Mr. Authority man? Yeah. And, uh, to everyone's surprise, he, he says does. Yes. And that's when Charlie realizes this guy is weird. <laughs> Yeah, this was a terrible idea. They go to the control rooms, and the kids are playing with it. Uh, they're trying. They're they're having a hard time moving the things again. And Dave gives them the old, "Why don't you let me try?" And they don't see a problem with that, so they let Dave try. And Dave punches these keys like like a hacker in an '80s movie, 
and he just manages to make the animals do all sorts of tricks and, and all the stuff they used to do. And they're like, oh, my God, how are you doing that? And they all run out of the room. And they watch. But then the characters start bugging. While the kids are distracted, they're like, hey, Dave, what's going on? What are you doing? And they go back in to check. Dave's gone. Oh, yeah. Dave's running. He's running and running and running to the office. But wait, there's more. Not all of the kids are there. Carlton and Jason have... Oh, that's right. They go to the arcade. Yeah, they've wandered off to the arcade because Jason's the big boy. He can't, be, he can't be bothered with robots and animatronics. He wants to go play video games. So Carlton was like, yeah, I'll take him out. I don't care. And this is when Jason sees more of those creepy transforming kid drawings. But now they're, you know, like the, the, the spooky haunted mansion style there on the wall is bleeding now. Yeah, it just occurred to me. Are we supposed to believe that those drawings are Michael communicating because he was the drawing one? I would I would be led to believe so. Yes. Okay. Interesting. Uh, yeah, yeah, that probably is exactly what that was supposed to be, and it was just... Jason didn't know Michael. Mike, Jason was a baby at the time of... No, but I mean, I, as an adult, should have figured this out. Maybe. But also, like, it's a kid's place. Like, how many other kids... You don't know anything about the other kids. Well, it seems like, though, that the drawings... They did... They like, did obviously, things. Michael didn't do all the drawings, but he is the one changing them. Yeah. It would be safe to assume. Yes. I'm with you now. So Dave's running. Dave's running. He's running, He's running. He's running like a maniac to the He's office. To the office. He gets in the office and he throws open a locker. And what's inside the locker, Shy? Golden Bonnie. Oh, my God. Dun, dun, dun. It was Dave the whole time. Damn it, Dave. So. <laughs> <laughs> Dave hops in to the spring lock suit. Pun intended. Pun intended. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, Dave gets into the suit, and this is where they cut back to Jason being scared out of his pants. Almost literally. I- I'm pretty sure that if-, if they ever made a movie on this book, they would- they would- they'd better make that boy pee his pants, because it would just be perfect. But- They are making a movie. Yeah, Bloomhouse is making a movie, and I'm, I'm excited for it, but I-, I don't know anything about it. Yeah. <laughs> That's like- I don't know if Blumhouse knows anything about it. Uh, that movie has been up and down and up and down. But anyway, this is where we find out that Jason actually sees Carlton get snatched. Yeah, so Carlton pops out from behind a curtain. Mm-hmm. And he, he... It's like a jump scare moment. Yeah. Because Jason's like not sure what's going on. Mm-hmm. When Carlton's like, hey, what's going on? Then the yellow paw comes and yoink. covers his mouth and covers his stomach and just rips him out. <laughs> rips him off stage. It doesn't cover his face and then cover his stomach and then rips oh, it, him Oh, out. yeah, it doesn't rip his stomach out. <laughs> it rips him off stage. It rips him off stage. You're right. Sorry, I made it a little too excited. <laughs> like I said, none of the main characters die. And then, so everybody gets freaked out because Jason went missing. Carlton went missing. No. Oh, well, they hear Jason scream. Yeah. And so they find Jason. And they're like, we got to go. We're getting out of here. This is getting too much. We're going to go get help. Yeah. And Jason, the whole time Jason's screaming, like, they, it took Carlton. I saw it. I watched him we disappear. Got, we got to help him. We got to help him. And they're like, yep, yeah, you know what? This is getting a little, a little too much for us to handle. We're going to go get help. Time to go get the police. Uh, they go get Officer Dewey. Uh, <laughs> Officer just, Dunn. That's just who he reminded me of, though. <laughs> if you've ever seen Scream, he reminded me a lot of Dewey. I did not have uh, high hopes for Officer Dunn. No. <laughs> so they go get Officer Dunn. Who uh, is Carlton's dad? No. They go to his dad first. Difference. Ah, uh, that's right. Difference. That's right. So in the book, what they do is. Um, they drive back into town. While they're driving back into town, they just spot Officer Dunn standing on the sidewalk. Mm-hmm. And they pull over and they get him. And he's like, why were you guys... You, so you came here to confess that you're trespassing to me? He goes back with them. Jason says something like, our friend's missing. And, and blah, blah, blah. And Dunn's getting the vibe that like this is a prank. They're, they're trying to mess with him. Mm-hmm. And he asks Jason, like, did they 
did they make you say that? Or, you know, what's going on here? Yeah. And Jason's like, no, we got to save, we got to save Carlton. And um, he's like, and then that's when Dunn's like, who? <laughs> oh, Carlton. And so he gets back on his radio. He had previously radioed in that he was going to check this out. And he goes, uh, yeah, yeah, call the chief. Uh, the kid I'm looking for is Carlton. And that's when you find out Carlton's been a notorious prankster since, since Michael disappeared. Yes. And his dad is the chief of police and Dewey has them go. Sorry, done. <laughs> <laughs> he really reminds me of Dewey from Scream. Uh, just that like, I'm, <laughs> you know, in Scream, Dewey is, is like, it starts off with like, uh, he's the older brother of the main girl's friend. Mm-hmm. I think he's Rose McGowan's brother. To be completely honest, I've never seen Scream. Oh my God. I know what we're doing. Oh. <laughs> oh, Scream is hilarious. <sighs> Scream is one of the funniest horror movies. It's supposed to be. Oh, yeah. Uh, no. Do, oh, God. You don't even know who Officer Dewey is. You're not even getting this joke. Oh, that's such a shame. So, anyway. Uh, Burke takes all the kids back to his house. And he's like, don't worry about it. Carlton's going to show up. He does this stuff all the time. And he, he sits him down. He has a, he has a real, like, father moment with them all. And he's like, you know, he does this. Don't worry about it. He's a prankster. You guys hang out. We'll have pancakes in the morning. Yep. This is also the night where Charlie has the dream. Ah, uh, yes. And the dream that is not the same in the graphic novel as it is in the book. Yes. I'm going to stand by this because I've reread it. Um, I specifically reread it because there is a key difference in the scene. Maybe it's not a key. Maybe it's not a key difference, though. Maybe maybe it's just another red herring. Yeah. So, in the book, the dream sequence goes. Charlie wakes up in the middle of a, a thunderstorm. She's a, a little girl. She's about eight years old. She starts walking down the stairs. As she walks down the stairs, by the time she gets to the bottom, she's a grown-up again. Mm-hmm. And when she looks towards her front door... She sees Foxy, the the animatronic, standing there with his silver eyes. Mm-hmm. And so this whole time I'm thinking the, the title, Silver Eyes, is Foxy. It's this animatronic her dad was building. Something about Foxy. Mm-hmm. I'm wondering, like, does her little brother's soul possess Foxy? I'm like, what is the what is the significance of Foxy? Charlie gets spooked. She runs back upstairs. By the time she gets back up the stairs, she's a little girl again. She runs to her dad's room. Her dad comes out of the room. Charlie turns around. Foxy's at the top of the stairs. Her dad walks over, soothes Foxy, like puts his hand on Foxy's shoulder, and Foxy deactivates. End of dream. That is not how it happens in the graphic novel. It's far simpler than that. Okay. Charlie wakes up. You don't know it's in the middle of a thunderstorm. But she she wakes up as a little girl and makes her way downstairs. Still as a little girl. She reaches out to shut the door because she sees that it's wide open. And that's when she's startled by something, turns around, and you see this endoskeleton of an animatronic with sharp teeth and claws and silver eyes. And all it asks is... Does it hurt? And then Charlie wakes up. I don't think the animatronic... I'm, I am 99% sure the animatronic does not talk. Though I do wonder if Foxy is not super significant, if in this case the comic book hasn't drilled it down to the relevant bits, and that I'm getting extra information or that I'm adding my own headcanon to the scene. It is possible. Like, there... There are enough, there are enough, like, small plot holes that can be, like, kind of, like, skipped over that if you wanted to hook into them and, like, dig in more, there's plenty to get through. So, why do you think the book is called The Silver Eyes? I think it is referring to the silver eyes of the animatronics when they're activated under their possessed state not activated under their normal operating state so their typical eyes are backlit by just a standard like yellow light yeah they're light. like your typical like 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 soft light colored like that so it's like a light bulb 
help. Like, yeah. But when they're they're actually possessed by their, their pupils turn silver. You see, like you see, kind of like in um, for those of you who have seen it, which I'm sure is most of you. The Little Mermaid, when you see Prince Eric get possessed by Ursula in her hot lady form, and you see that, like, glint of, like, white silver come in his eyes as you can you can tell he's being possessed, that's what happens with these animatronics, is you see that glint of silver coming out of their pupils, and that is the soul that is possessing them so be- taking full hold. So then because Charlie saw this animatronic in her dad's workshop with silver eyes, does that mean that the animatronic was possessed at that stage? These are all memories that may or may not be influenced by... This is why I have a hard time parsing the message of this book. (laughs) The book is called The Silver Eyes, and the picture on the cover of the book is like the concept art from the game, or screenshot from the game, I can't really tell. And it has uh, like photoshopped in red glowing eyes. It's better than the initial cover, which had a weird barn house in the background. For right, no but reason. like, why are the. Like, it's the silver eyes. Why are they glowing red? I don't know, Ben. I'm not the artist who did the cover. They wake up. Uh, they're all having pancakes in the morning. They're, Carlton hasn't showed up yet, but don't worry. He's, We're having pancakes for breakfast, he's, kids. He's probably going to show up. And, and then and then Carlton's mom comes downstairs. She's like, why are all these teenagers in my house? Uh, none of which are my child. Where is my child? Yeah, where's the one I own? <laughs> <laughs> the dad says like, oh, he played some prank and uh, he, he's, he hasn't come home yet. And they wind up telling the story of how they went back to, to Freddy Fazbear's. And His, then the mom is like, Freddy's. His mom swiftly reminds his father that of all of the kids who have been traumatized by Michael's disappearance, do you really think Carlton, after giving that heartfelt speech, would do anything to dishonor or sully Michael's memory? Well, it's not just that. I think the mom also has, like in the book, I get the vibe that the mom has a much deeper understanding of what Carlton's going through than the dad does. Yeah. And, and partly I think it's because Carlton maybe tries to act a little tougher around his dad. Mm-hmm. And she goes to call the police and the dad's like, I am the police. And she's like, well, then why aren't you looking for my son? Yep. And so Chief Burke has to go out and, and look for the look for Carlton. And they immediately call Officer Dunn. Dunn, Dunn, Dunn. The best on the force. <sighs> Poor guy. Oh, do you want to walk us through what happens, or do you want me to walk us through what happens? I would rather you walk us through what happens. I'm just really sad about that. In the graphic novel, he has, like, a whole, you know, like, a page and a half, and it's like, this is really sad. <laughs> Officer Dunn is 20, but he's he's one day from retirement. He's forever young. He is now. <laughs> <laughs> he is now. So, <laughs> so Officer Dunn goes back. He goes to the mall, and he... Goes into Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria, and he's looking around. He sees the animatronics. He thinks, like, oh, that's neat. They're kind of creepy, though. Mm -hmm. And he walks around. He's poking, checking, doing his police thing. And he opens the office, and he opens the locker, and he sees a rabbit suit there. It's just a creepy rabbit suit. No big deal, right? Then the rabbit suit jumps up, and the rabbit has a knife. Weep, 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 weep. And he just stabs Dunn. Dunn is done. Dunn is done. You really proud of that? Yes. (laughs) Yeah, Dunn bleeds out and he's dead. And now we know stuff is real and Carlton is probably not okay. Correct. (laughs) Uh, So Dunn never comes back. Nope. Uh, I mean, alive. Yeah, well, presumably the cops would be wondering why Dunn hasn't reported back in. The chief of police wasn't worried about his son getting snatched. We have to watch Scream. (laughs) There are so many parallels between it and Scream. (laughs) Just the incompetence of the police force in this town. Like, Scream is about, like, a small town with an incompetent police force where, like, people are getting killed and, like, they're in so far over their head. Now is when uh, John and Charlie go back to Charlie's house. Oh, right, right. And while they're waiting for Officer Dunn to report back to yeah, they go to Chief Burke. Yeah, yeah, because the kids are supposed to leave soon. Yep, but they decide they're going to stick around another day mm-hmm. until they find out, you know, that Carlton's okay. Yeah. So they go back to Charlie's house, and this is where they find the photo album. Yep. 
and they find the photo album and in it is a picture of the grand opening of of Fred Bear's family diner. Yes, of the original restaurant. Mm-hmm. And they find out that her dad had a business partner. And that business partner looks just like Dave. And so they go to the library. A scene which is more developed in the book for some reason. Um, yeah. So in the book, yeah, the librarian's like super anxious, like like super happy that somebody finally needs a librarian. <laughs> And this is set in the 90s, so it's like, they can't just Google it. Yeah. So they go to the librarian, and the librarian hooks them up with like the microfiche to uh, look through the newspaper articles, and they find the opening article where they discover that uh, Dave is not his real name. Oh, no. The restaurant, the, the missing partner, was William Afton. Bum, bum, bum. And that's when Marla bursts in because we're done with that scene. Yeah. It's like, on <laughs> it's, to the next. It's, yeah, it's, it's, we gotta move MacGuffin this. MacGuffin Marla's coming in to <laughs> move <laughs> things along. <laughs> yeah, move this book along. <laughs> Jason is missing. He went back to find Carlton because he didn't think the cops were taking this seriously enough, which was a smart move on Jason's part, kind of. Yeah. The cops, he was correct. The cops were not taking it seriously. He was incorrect that he was the right person to do anything about that. Yes and no. Yes and no. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Oh, I see what you're saying. Jason has gone back to the pizzeria. Mm-hmm. And when they get to the mall, and I guess this is something else that's developed more in the book. Jason has gone in through uh, an opening that it, the, the door is welded shut now. Yeah. William Afton has totally like barricaded himself in the restaurant. Mm-hmm. Jason has snuck in through a, a vent or something that is too small for the uh, fully grown teenagers to squeeze through. Yeah. So they find that there is a gap between the restaurant of the roof and the and the roof of the mall that they can crawl through. The roof of the restaurant? The restaurant of the roof is what you said. Oh, whatever. <laughs> I. So this got really confusing for me. Like, it, I, I don't... <laughs> They basically found a way to mouse their way into yeah, they after find, they find a way into the restaurant through the roof. I it's it's confusing in the book. And it's totally skipped in the graphic novel. All you all you see is Charlie is like, I know a way in and they're in. In the book, they're kind of dealing with like Jess is claustrophobic and it's like crawling through this thing is like gross and dark and creepy and horror movie tensiony. You don't know where William Afton is. Is he sneaking around? Is he going to catch them coming in through the roof? And yeah. they're trying to play that up. It It's undercut somewhat by trying to describe the strange geometry of a building inside a building and yeah. multiple roofs. Uh, just describing that with text, it didn't really work for me. Yeah, and w- which is why I completely understand. It wasn't, it wasn't like essential to the story it was just kind no. of a little bit of side character building it was yeah it added some flavor or it attempted to add some flavor and like jess didn't get a lot of shine so yeah. like her claustrophobia and her trying to power through her claustrophobia to save her friend was a character development moment it's probably about the only real character development she got in this book yeah but also while they're you know trying to find jason and trying to m- mouse their way into the building this is when in the graphic novel, at least, you get the bit of exposition of, yes, I am William Afton, and that is a suit that is going to kill you if you don't if you don't stop wiggling around. This is where Carl, they cut to Carlton, who's finally oh, yes, waking yes, up. Yes, yes, Yeah, so while they're trying to sneak in, William Afton has his, has his little serial killer, I'm going to explain my evil plan moment. Blah, 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 blah. I'm yeah. going to kill you. And this is also where Golden Freddy sits, so... Mm-hmm. Carlton is currently in the golden Bonnie suit. No, Carlton is just in a suit. Oh, in an unspecified suit. William Afton is notorious for the golden Bonnie suit. Okay. So Carlton is... So what William Afton has done, this is his plan. This is, I guess, how he kills all of the people. Yeah, basically. So this is how he kills the kids. He puts them inside one of these spring lock suits. Mm-hmm. And when they inevitably trigger it, it they, just... they die horribly by being crushed to death from six different angles. 
pierced and, pierced through all their major vital organs. Yeah, and eventually they just sort of bleed to death internally. Yeah. Carlton is in a springlock suit, and if he makes one wrong move, which he will inevitably do, it will snap shut. It and will, it will kill snap him. shut and kill him. And they do make it a point to say it is a slow, painful death. It is a slow bleed out because logically, you still have all of these, all I of these assumed, things pierced inside of you. I assumed it just crushed your bones and your bones pierce your organs and you just slowly bleed out. Yeah. Either way, you're slowly bleeding out. It is yeah. not a fun experience. So. He's in a storeroom. Conveniently, the storeroom cannot be seen on the cameras. It is literally the only room that doesn't have a camera. There is one more room that is not seen on camera, but does have a camera, and that's the kitchen. That is basically a throwback to the first game. The kitchen didn't have a working camera. Whoopee. Okay. (laughs) So, in the storeroom with Carlton, William Afton leaves... Mm -hmm. Carlton's gaze is drawn to a Golden Freddy suit. Yes. And he starts to, like, think it's talking to him. It it starts to feel, what I would assume is, feel the phrase, it's me. Which, in the game, especially in the, I believe, the first game, when you see Golden Freddy, like, one of the signs that he's nearby is you hear, it's me, it's me, it's me, it's me. And it's literally a soul trying to call out to be recognized. Right. And that's exactly what... So he gets left in there with with this Golden Freddy that starts trying to communicate with him. Mm Mm-hmm. Cut back to the kids sneaking in. They found a skylight. Mm Mm-hmm. They drop down. The book also makes a very confusing explanation for why they can get down but not up. Yeah. Uh, It doesn't make sense. And we're just... Again, I'm... I would be perfectly willing to just say the thing locked behind them or something. The MacGuffin MacGuffined its way out. Yeah. They they try to, like, they break the window in such a way that somehow they can't get back. It doesn't make any sense. So, they're stuck in there. They gotta find another way out. Basically, they split up into two groups. You have Jess, John, and Charlie in one group. And then you have Marla and Lamar in the other group. Marla and Lamar are on their way to go find Jason. Meanwhile, Jess, John, and Charlie are on the way to go find Carlton. Because the assumption is Charlie knows where Carlton would potentially be held. Because MacGuffin. Well, because Charlie's the like owner's daughter. She knows the place better than they do. They've only ever been in the public spaces. And the kitchen, I think it's hinted. Yeah, but they also have a... Uh, they, they don't do... Uh, phenomenal job of reassuring you that charlie remembers everything no, period charlie you you get the like reluctant leadership vibe from charlie yeah like charlie's leading this expedition because only charlie can yeah whether or not she has the, the whether or not she believes in herself is a different matter but she's putting on a strong face for the group yeah now basically from here it's just a lot of in the graphic novel it happens a little fast where it goes from all right, we found Jason to now we got to find Carlton. Now we found all these cameras. Now we're locked in. Now we're locked out. Okay. Like, oh, there's a lot of people getting locked in a, lo- a, diff- a bunch of different rooms. Yeah, the camera rooms feature prominently, which if you hadn't ever played the game and didn't know anything about the game, you would probably be very confused as to why we're doing so much stuff with these camera rooms. Yeah. But that they're playing the game. It's Well, it's a nod to the game. Yeah. So once the kids get into the building, now the animatronics start moving around. Yeah, now everything's starting to come to life. Now things are starting to get really dangerous. And they're starting to understand how dangerous things actually are getting for them. Yeah. Yeah, so all the animatronics have come to life, which is probably very shocking to this group of kids who don't know anything about this. Oh, yeah, they have they have no idea that these are like totally sentient possessed demon animatronics they're just like which why are they walking around like this i'm gonna say is kind of a weakness of the story like of the book in that if you if you only take the book as like a self-contained entity it's really weird that they didn't develop the animatronics walking around at all throughout the entire book yeah yeah that is one of those where... They where, just kind of start moving. Like, they... The books rely heavily enough on the hope that you know something about Five Nights at Freddy's that you can just kind of 
fill in some of these gaps on your own. And if you don't, it's going to leave you scratching your head a little bit. Ordinarily, this is part of the reason I don't like video game books Mm -hmm. because that that is almost always the case it's always like a toy for you to continue your your video game adventure or a toy for you to continue the movie in the case of five nights of freddy's i'm gonna give it a little bit of a pass on that because five nights at freddy's is and has always kind of been a multimedia project yeah this is obviously something scott cawthon engaged with cared about it wasn't just a rubber stamp let's make a kid's book because our game's popular with kids yeah so the book does have something to offer but yeah at this point like can i recommend the book as an entry point to the series not really i would recommend the book series the books the the first three five nights at freddy's books the silver eyes the twisted ones and the fourth closet if you read them as their own trilogy they can kind of stand shakily on their own. I wouldn't give them like a solid pass that they are their own. They could be their own thing. I would say at minimum, you have to play a Five Nights at Freddy's game. I I would say you would at least have to know about what Five Nights at Freddy's is. At least the baseline, it's this possessed animatronic thing. And you would have to know that that there there are elements to the story that you're never going to get by reading the books. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> Why did the animatronics start chasing them now? And the the reason is the presence of Dave, I guess. Yeah, now that now that Dave's here in his in his special golden bonnie suit, now the animatronics are like really mad. Yeah, so he's triggering the spirits that mm-hmm. So obviously what has happened now is that there is a kid inside each of these suits. There's a, a kid's soul within each of these suits. Potentially the body's still there. They never found them. But we'll we'll just I, say. the way I took it was like Oh, the way I understood it was that he put these kids in the suits, pulled the spring locks, and yeah, th- they're, yeah. they're still in the suits. Yeah. I'm also thinking of realistic human composition 10 years later. Oh, yeah. Is, <laughs> is, there, is there much left? Well, there's a skeleton inside the suits. Yeah. That's what we're... At the end of the day, there is a tormented soul inside those suits, body or not. Yeah. But I think we're supposed to gather from what happened to Michael, from what's happening to Carlton. Yes. This is how they died. Yeah. Uh, Charlie eventually does find Carlton in the storeroom. And she's the only one who can free Carlton from the springlock suit. Yeah, she had a flight. Her dad did teach her to be careful around springlocks and how they worked a little bit. Yeah. She can undo the locks that Carlton is stuck in. But it has to be very quick and very careful. They actually... I don't know if they show it or like describe it in the book, but in the graphic novel, they actually do a good job of building the suspense of Charlie trying to keep her cool while trying to unhook the suit. She's, she herself is trying to keep herself from sweating on the suit and is trying to keep Carlton calm while she herself is like, I really hope I do this without killing my best friend. The way they describe it in the book is they do a good job. Like they really do a good job of conveying like her tension. Like it, it describes it as like her putting her hand like, her finger, she puts the back of her hand to his neck and mm-hmm. like her fingers try to undo the stuff that's around his neck and she can feel like his pulse Yikes! as she's, yeah. So she feels him like tense and she feels like how like warm his body is. And she knows that, you know, if she f- screws up, she's going to be feeling like his death spasms. Mm-hmm. And so it is pretty brutal. Like they convey the pressure that's on Charlie pretty well. Charlie, when she comes into the storm, I got completely breeze past that. When Charlie comes into the storeroom, she frees Carlton, and then William Afton's coming back into the storeroom. Yeah, she totally beans him. <laughs> this is literally where everything just goes from, like, zero to 100. It's like one story beat after the other. It's like... like walk us through the important things. So Jason gets snatched. Uh, all the group, All the groups come back together. They're all traumatized. Basically, it's a combination of they find Officer Dunn's body, they tie up William Afton, they teenage torture him, which they just see, they just show John giving him one good pot shot to the jaw. (laughs) This is where you find out how exactly crazy William Afton is and how attached he is psychologically to the Golden Bonnie suit. This is where you find out William Afton really is the psycho child killer that the police (laughs) copyright strike 
<laughs> I'm not on YouTube. All right. <laughs> so that's where they find out that he's the psycho killer because he will not, like, he's just catatonic. He's catatonic. Now that he's been revealed as uh, William Afton, his brain will not function any other way unless he has the golden bonnie helmet on. Yeah, he will not be William Afton. He needs to be Dave or he needs to be... Springtrap. Springtrap. Bonnie, golden Bonnie. So he will not talk. He just stares blankly at the golden Bonnie helmet. It's kind of like the, I need it. I need it. Uh, but after after everybody's all thoroughly chased, now they're all huh, thoroughly chased. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, John. <laughs> Shut, up. Shut up, Ben. <laughs> Now they're all cornered by the animatronics. They're all like, you know, back to back. We're gonna, we're in this together, guys. Don't worry, we're gonna be okay. Oh yeah, the animatronics fully surround them. Yeah. And there's no way out. They're all gonna die. But they all see, they all see and recognize that their childhood friend Michael is in the golden Freddy suit. Yeah, golden because, Freddy comes walking up. And um, is is Officer Burke there yet? Officer Burke is. At the same time, busting through the wall. Okay. Now he just he just bursts his way onto the scene. So as so he bursts in like as they're all surrounded, and he's like, yeah. "Oh, whoops." Yeah. <laughs> but meanwhile, while everybody was being chased around and cornered by the evil, spooky animatronics, William Afton put the rest of his costume on after somehow getting out of his ties, and now he's snatch Charlie. Oh, yeah, William Afton grabs Charlie around the neck and, like, holds her hostage. Yep. <laughs> As the animatronics are circling in, and Burke is in, and we've got a, a three-way, like, Mexican standoff situation. Y yeah, basically. <laughs> and um, the animatronics are like, kill, and the, the kids are like, please no, and William Afton is like, murder die. Golden Freddy manages to kind of stop the other animatronics. It's it's implied that he he's the one that's like in like a passive control like he well he, he like they've established that there is some level of communication yes like this is another thing that i guess is kind of vague in the five nights at freddy's world the ghosts can't just talk they have to leave like little pictures and they they can't necessarily they don't seem to have like the full range of sense senses or or the full mental faculty to distinguish between who they're actually trying to get. Yeah, they just know that. And it's it's easier to kind of string this thought along in the games because you're always playing a security guard. And you can say that the animatronics, ha even though you're not the security guard that killed these kids. They have an association with security guards. Yeah. This, you're just kind of assuming that anyone who Any seems like an adult figure... Yeah is dangerous to them. Yeah. Yeah, so they're they're ghosts, but they almost behave like a curse. Where like they, a curse has a they set almost of... behave like angry children who can't discern one one person who's taller than them from another. I guess. I I mean it's except Golden Freddy, who recognizes his friends, I guess. Yeah. I guess they, they because the bond between them was so strong, he's able to Yeah. Yeah. And that the other ghosts can recognize him as a, a trusted figure. Yeah, they see that Golden Golden Freddy is, is one of them. Yeah. And so when he says, don't do this, they're like, okay. Yeah, but he never actually says Yeah, he never just, says it. He just appears. It's and, just the implied psychic connection between them is like, uh-uh, uh, uh, uh I, re I recognize some of these. Some of these might be okay. Yeah, so it's, and I guess that is kind of the moral reward is that they all, they all did have a genuine bond with him and they all did come back for him. Yeah. And... Um, so Charlie has her badass moment. Being basically her father's little helper, she knows how to, how to snap these, um, oh, spring it's, locks. Well, it's really easy to do it the wrong way. Oh, it's really easy to do it the <laughs> wrong way. But it's also really, really easy to do from apparently the back of the head. So Charlie just reaches up in the graphic novel. All she does is she reaches, reaches up, slings her hand into the back of the golden Bonnie helmet and snaps the lock. A and it should be mentioned, this isn't the first time that William Afton's been snapped in a suit. 
Well, that's what we get from the scars on his neck. That's kind of why I brought that up. Is that yeah. Everybody talks about him like he's dead. I don't know if he's actually like a zombie. But either way, he's pretty beat up because, like, they mentioned he was like this big, like, rotund dude who, when he was opening the restaurants, and he was like mm-hmm. very friendly and everything. And now he's this scrawny, hollow, dead-eyed yeah. man who, who who is covered in scars. Who who looks like he's the Walking Dead? Yeah, yeah. Basically, Charlie snaps the suit onto William Afton. William Afton gets shanked and skewered from all directions and collapses to the floor and the animatronics take him away they just grab him and drag him off yeah they drag him back into into freddy's and it's time to get some revenge and chief burke is like let's go let's pretend this never happened (laughs) he just watched charlie murder a man and he's like nope didn't see a thing yep and they're like, what about Officer Dunn? And he's like, the book's over. <laughs> so <laughs> Officer Dunn? More like the book is done. <laughs> he's like, I'll, I'll make it go away. <laughs> I'm the police. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's that's kind of how the book ends. Uh, Charlie and, and her friends have to part ways and go back to their normal lives. But I suspect they haven't seen the last of one another. Okay. (laughs) As someone who knows too much about the series, it's one of those like, yeah, no, this isn't the last time. And it won't be the last time after that. And it won't be the last time after that. (laughs) Well, I guess, I guess that's a good place to stop. It's the last word with Nate. Getting in the last word, even if I'm not featured in the episode and I have to record it after the fact. I'm... Looking forward to listening to this episode that you guys have just listened to. I think it's going to be a fun time. If you had a good time, please feel free to reach out to us on Twitter at WABpod and let us know. I'm sure it will make Ben happy. Just know one thing. No matter how much you liked it, you can't replace me. I'm coming back, and there's nothing you can do to stop. Also, don't forget... If you're interested in throwing a few bucks our way, we're on Buy Me a Coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash wabpod. In my case, you'll be buying baby formula instead of coffee. That's right. I don't know if Ben's mentioned this yet on the air. I know we've, we've talked about how my wife is coming due, but at the end of April, I successfully gave birth to... Assisted in giving birth was in the room for the birth of our daughter. So she's healthy, everything went well. It was a it was a a nightmare. <laughs> it was it was not fun for my wife at all, but the end result is we got a healthy baby girl. And uh really, really, really smart of Ben to decide that maybe he should do a few special episodes without me. Because Holy shit, do you know how much time a baby takes away from you, even though they sleep like 90% of any given day? What a smart call by Ben. Anyway, I'll be back to discuss Promise of Blood by Brian McClellan. I've got I've got some things to say on that one, but should be a good one. And now, some random facts that I learned as we fade out. Did you know that a baby is supposed to poop three to four times a day, but they can actually just store all of that inside them in some sort of magical pocket and just shoot it out of them all at once after waiting two days without a normal poop? Did you know that vanilla orange coat, first of all, it tastes better than it sounds, and second of all, it and a bottle of that? I'm getting the beatus.